Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we welcome you to worship this morning at First Presbyterian Church. We are thrilled that you are here as we uh, commit our worship unto the Lord, as we enter into his pre presence and the splendor of holiness. We know that our God especially meets with us as we gather on the Lord's Day. Uh, we affirm uh, as Bible-believing Christians that our God is omnipresent, that he is everywhere but especially uh, his word promises us that he is here as we gather in his house in his name on his day. And so uh, we come anticipating our Lord being amongst us and knowing that when we come into the presence of the Almighty God, we never leave the same way in which we came, that we will be conformed into the image of his Son for his glory and for the advancement of his kingdom. And so we hope that you come anticipating a mighty move from the Lord uh, as well. There's a couple of announcements that's mentioned on the back of your bulletins. Uh, and then there's a, a few announcements that I want to mention that's not in your bulletin. Uh, we are asking that you be mindful of uh, your giving to the church, especially during the summer months. Uh, these months as families travel uh, here and there for vacation, uh, we know that we uh, miss some, some services. And so we hope that you'll catch up as uh, you feel led to. And also there's a reminder that there's no children's church during the months of June and July. Uh, your children are more than welcome to be here in the sanctuary with us. Uh, we quite like the babbling. Uh, it, it reminds us that we're a covenant family from the youngest to the oldest uh, here at First Pres. And so uh, please understand, they don't bother us. Uh, they are welcome here. But if you uh, are in desperate need of a cry room, uh, the Fellowship Hall is directly below us. Uh, and you can find the service streamed into that room uh, for your convenience. And then rally day is quickly approaching, August the 27th. Uh, we'll have our breakfast at 9 a.m. We'll recognize our Sunday school teachers and then promote some of our children uh, to their next Sunday school class. We hope that you'll join us. Uh, this morning we do have the, the privilege and the honor of baptizing uh, Elizabeth Thomas Adams. Uh, my daughter and Beth's daughter. Um, and so we'll do that immediately. Yay, she's clapping. Yeah. Um, we'll do that uh, right after the, the giving of the tithes and the offerings. Uh, and we also want you to go ahead and be begin to prepare your hearts. Uh, we'll have communion next Sunday evening. Uh, and so we hope that you'll be with us to gather around the Lord's table as well. Well, that concludes our announcements. Hear now the call to worship. Our God calls us to worship by his word. He invites us uh, into his presence. And our call to worship this morning comes from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 25. If you'll please stand as you're able. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait on him, to the soul who seeks him. As we come into the presence of our good and faithful God, uh, let us sing that hymn that was written with this uh, very text in mind, hymn number 32, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
together. Father in heaven, we do come proclaiming that your faithfulness is great to us. You have shown your favor to us and you have showered us with blessings from above. And so we come into your presence with much thanksgiving and praise, knowing that you are a good God who bestows upon his people rich gifts uh, from above. And so we come praising your name, asking that you would be present here with us, enabling us by your spirit to worship you in spirit and in truth, knowing, Lord, that as your word is read and preached, uh, Lord, that you have uh, promised that you would do a good work here amongst us. And so we pray, Lord, that you would sanctify us, that you would set us afire with the gospel so that we might uh, encourage one another as a church and so that we might go into a world, a lost and dying world, and proclaim the good news of great joy uh, for all people that Christ came and died and is resurrected and ascended on high for the salvation of all who believe. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as you see in our uh, bulletins on page two, as we continue on in our order of worship, you'll notice that the next thing uh, that we're going to do together is to confess our sins uh, corporately as a body together uh, to the Lord. Uh, of course, uh, we are forgiven of our sins, past, present, and future, when we do come in saving faith to the Lord Jesus Christ and cast ourselves upon him and his mercy. Uh, however, the Bible just as much tells us that if we confess our sins to him, that God is faithful and righteous to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So uh, we'll take a, a brief moment, maybe 30 seconds or so, uh, on your own silently just to go to the Lord to confess your sins to him. And then we'll come together uh, and we'll use the prayer that's printed on page two again in the bold to uh, confess our sins together to the Lord. So let's take a, a brief moment now to go to the Lord quietly and then we'll come together and confess our sins together. So let's go to the Lord now. Now, let us pray together using this prayer printed on your bulletin. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is your will that we should love you with heart, soul, mind, strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. But we are not sufficient for these things. We confess that our affections continually turn away from you from purity to lust, from freedom to slavery, from compassion to indifference, from fullness to emptiness. Have mercy on us, order our lives by your holy word, and make your commandments the joy of our hearts. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Now hear from God's word uh, this Assurance, this scripture that should bring assurance to our hearts about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says this, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Well, praise be to God that the Lord Jesus Christ receives sinners, and only sinners, uh, as those whom he saves. Um, well, as Pastor Matt again brought up uh, in the announcements, uh, we do need to remember to be faithful. We know we're in the, the dog days of summer here, and, uh, but uh, that's the hardest time for all churches, really, in terms of uh, remaining faithful in our giving. And uh, so let us just rem uh, be reminded to do so. And uh, let's now worship the Lord. Uh, in the giving of our tithes and offerings, deacons, if you would come forward 
and let's worship together in this way. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you for your gifts that you give to us, Lord. We thank you and acknowledge that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. 
with whom there is no change or shadow of turning. Lord, we thank you for these financial offerings, these gifts and tithes. Lord, we pray that they'll go toward uh, your kingdom, that they'll be yours, used for your glory alone. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. It's always a real joy uh, in the life of our church uh, to baptize our covenant children into the covenant community uh, here at First Presbyterian. If you've been keeping up with the church life in this past week, you know that uh, three of our families have uh, welcomed in new babies uh, into the life of the church. And then the next step, uh, of course, as they are still children, uh, is to baptize them. Now, of course, we have to explain each and every time that we come uh, to uh, this sacrament of baptism in the life of the church, why we baptize our children, why we baptize babies. It's not that we believe that this baptism saves them. We know that at, a, at the right age, God must call them unto himself, and they must make that personal decision to follow Christ and to receive him in faith. But we do know, because of the continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament, that as a child of a believer or believers, that there are covenant promises to be enjoyed even by young Elizabeth Thomas, Eliza. We, we see all the way back at Abraham the sign of circumcision being given there in Genesis 17 and 20, where there is a promise being made to all those people who have the covenant sign of circumcision I will be your God and you will be my people. I will be with you. I will protect you. I will provide for you. And then in the New Testament, as the Apostle Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2, he re-emphasizes, he uses those same words that God uses with Abraham in Genesis 17 to call the people to repentance in the New Testament church in Acts chapter 2. As he preaches Christ and Him crucified, the men and the women who were listening were struck to the heart and conviction. And they asked Peter, Peter, what are we to do? How must we be saved? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, each and every one of you. For the promise is for you and for your children and for those who are far off. Because there's no more need for the shedding of blood. Because Christ has perfectly satisfied the bloodshed that is needed for the salvation of sinners, for the cleansing of sin. We have moved from circumcision in the Old Testament now to baptism in the New. And just as this covenant sign was given to the children in the Old, the command of the Scriptures is that we are to give it to the children of the New. And the blessing of being a member of the covenant community, especially here at First Presbyterian Church, is not only does Eliza have her parents and her family to raise her up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, but she has all of you as well. And so here in just a moment, Pastor Don will ask the baptismal vows of Beth and I, but then he'll turn to you and ask you the congregational vow of baptism. Will you assist in the raising up of Elizabeth Thomas in the ways of the faith so that she might at a young age uh, come to Christ in saving uh, mercy, relying on his salvation, his atonement for the forgiveness of sins alone. And so, Dr. Brown, if you'll come, Beth and Anna Kate and Brooks and Eliza, I guess Eliza doesn't have a choice but to come, uh, and then Pastor Don, if you can come as well. So I'm going to read those covenant promises that uh, Pastor Matt just alluded to uh, from Acts and Genesis. For to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy house. Now for the parents, Matt and Beth, I have these questions to ask y'all. If you agree, if you would just say, I do or I will. 
do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you claim God's covenant promises in her behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for Eliza's salvation as you do for your own? Do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example, that you will pray with and for Eliza, that you will teach her the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, do you? Now to the congregation and family, as there's a lot of family here who, Lord willing, will be involved in the raising of this child. Uh, I will ask you a question as well, and if you agree, if you would raise your right hand and say, I do, uh, as well. And the question to the congregation and family is, do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of this child, do you? the world. For her you have sent the patriarchs and the prophets of old. For you, you have made promises and covenants with your people. For you, you have given, us the, given to us and to her the written word of God. For her, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ became a man, lived a perfect life, died upon a cross, and was raised again in victory for our salvation. And we understand, Lord, that uh, little Eliza cannot understand these things now. But yet we promise to teach them to her and proclaim them to her until she makes this faith her own. And so, Father, we do pray that she would come at a right early age to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and that she would uh, have that testimony of the covenant child that she never remembers a day that she did not know who Jesus was, that she did not know of her need of a Savior, and that she possessed faith in the Lamb who was slain. We pray all these things in your Son's name. Amen. You know, seven years, seven years I've been baptizing babies here, and not one of them's cried <laughs> up until mine. But first, first senior church, see how much the Lord loves us and he gives us covenant children who are a heritage from the Lord. Look, she's going to wave now. Good job. Very good. Well, it's good for us to sing in response to the sacrament. And so if you would uh, please stand and turn to 648 and let us sing that well-known hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee.
out your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 119. This morning our scripture text is Psalm 119 verses 57 through 80. And as you turn there, the choir will join the congregation for the preaching. Well, if you're using a that text is found for you on 652. And as we've been uh, journeying through this psalm together, this lengthy psalm together this summer, uh, we've recognized and we have mentioned repeatedly for you uh, that the psalmist David, he uses this psalm to work through his infatuation, his adoration uh, with the word of God. In fact, what he does here is that he uses a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, he uses the whole Hebrew alphabet, to exhaustively proclaim that the Word of God is a lamp unto his feet uh, and a light unto his path. And how much he treasures the Word of God and how much he values the Word of God and how much he loves the Word of God. And we've been mentioning throughout the past number of weeks how this is completely applicable. It's full of application for the Christian because we ought to have that same treasuring for our Bibles as the psalmist David has here in this psalm. In fact, what he's doing as he uses each and every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, it's much like an acronym that we would use today. He starts with Aleph and he begins to write all of these ways with the letter Aleph and how much he loves the Word of God. It's something, uh, you know, like uh, in elementary school, and I've used this illustration before, how we would write our name vertically down a page, and then we would have to write adjectives for each and every letter. So you have, you know, Matthew, magnificent, awesome, terrific. Um, I mean, you just go through all the great adjectives, and, and, and that is my name. And and that's something that the psalmist David is doing. He uses this alphabet to speak of the the greatness of uh, the Word of God and how applicable it is for for the Christian life. And so here in stanzas 8, 9, and 10 that we're going to read, he uses this Word, this treasured Word of God, to proclaim to him first the gospel and then how it ought to be the Christian's desire, the Christian's aspiration uh, to live for his glory. And so we're going to read stanzas 8, 9, and 10, verses 57 through 80. Hear now the word of God that is perfect and inerrant and written for you. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I am a companion for all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts, The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. 
It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to the promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me that I may live for your law is my delight. Let the insolent be put to shame because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, that they may know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statutes, that I may not be put to shame. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever and ever. Well, there on the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus teaches his disciples what a disciple's life ought to look like. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Now commentators and theologians throughout the church age has used that verse to speak of the practicality of the Christian life. How it is to know uh, where our heart is, what we treasure. Often they will say something along the lines of, where your mind wanders in the, in the midst of the day, what your mind goes to and thinks about in the quiet moments of life is where your treasure is, is what you aspire to do or aspire to be. That is what you hold most valuable in your life. And so that, that verse in Matthew chapter 6, and even that admonition or exhortation, from the theologians and the commentators throughout the church age, it, it kind of asks you, it demands for you to search your own heart and say, well, what is your treasure? Where is your heart? What is your portion? What is your inheritance? What is your reward? What is the greatest desire of your heart? Often in, in counseling sessions, especially premarital counseling sessions, I, I ask young couples what the greatest desire is that they have for their marriage is. And I'm never looking for an exactly right answer. There's many different answers that they might give that are good and right. But it's always quite interesting, isn't it? Different couples aspire to be different things as a family. And, and yet, even though the questions are different, they all want to be something. They all want to be someone. They all have aspirations, desires, their hearts are set on certain things. And yet the psalmist speaks of here in verse 57, the first five words of these three stanzas, that for the Christian, the Lord must be our portion. The Lord is our treasure, our inheritance. The psalmist David actually asserts very quickly. And the first thing that we need to learn here is simply this, that the believer's reward and the believer's desire, the believer's treasure is the Lord himself. And I really want us to understand that in two ways this morning. I want us to understand it first as it's a reality, it's just a fact, that the Lord is our portion. And then secondly, I want us to understand that the Lord being our portion is what we should aspire to. And so think about it this way as we think about the reality of this statement, that the Lord is my portion, I want you to think about it like this, that the greatest gift that God gives you is Himself. The greatest gift that God gives you is Himself. If we were to go around the room, we would probably all say, if we were asked the question, what is the greatest gift that God has given you? I hope you would say something along the lines of, well, He has given me my salvation. He has given me my forgiveness. If you're theologically astute, you might even say, He has given me my justification. That is what we call the, the one-time act where God counts us as righteous because of His Son. And yet, all of those things, your salvation, your forgiveness, your justification 
isn't the greatest gift that God gives you as you unite yourself to Him in faith. And I know that causes a little bit of pause, doesn't it? You say, well, Matt, are you a little off base when you say that? But understand what the Scriptures teach when it talks about our salvation, our justification, our forgiveness of sin. He does these things so that we might have communion and fellowship with Him. If you go all the way back to Genesis 3, and uh, you know how God creates the, the heavens and the earth, and He puts Adam and Eve over, He gives them dominion over His creation, and they have perfect harmony and union and communion and fellowship with one another. So much so that it says that Adam and Eve and Christ Himself walk in the midst of the day, in the cool of the morning, in the cool of the evening. It's that sign of, of perfect harmony, fellowship. And then as sin enters into the world, we know that that fellowship is hindered. That communion is broken. And yet, right after sin is introduced into the world, in the first part of Genesis 3, in the second part of Genesis 3, God says, I will actually, I will actually make all of this new again. I will give us harmony. I will give us communion. I will give us fellowship. And I will do it by sending my only son, the seed of the woman, who will crush the head of Satan, the serpent, so that we might have an unhindered communion with one another again. And so we see that the love of God as He is offered in the gospel is for us to have a fellowship with Him so that we might receive Him, so that we might say along with the psalmist David that the Lord is my portion the greatest gift of God. And He gives us all sorts of great gifts, doesn't He? But the greatest gift of God is actually Himself. He desires for us to know Him. He desires for us to have Him, to possess Him as our God. He desires to have communion with us and fellowship with us. He, he desires so much so these things that He would forgive us of our sins cleanse us from our iniquities, send His only begotten Son to be a ransom for all who believe. And that's almost a little bit of a side note. That's the free offer of the gospel, isn't it? The free offer of the gospel is that, is that we can come to Christ freely and receive a salvation in Him fully. While I was on a way or while I was away on vacation these past uh, couple of weeks, I was rereading Dr. Sinclair Ferguson's book entitled The Whole Christ. And I'm always so encouraged by that short little read because it reminds me so well of the, the beauty of the gospel. And Dr. Ferguson says, as he talks about theological controversy surrounding the Westminster Assembly, he states that the free offer of the gospel is contained right here in John chapter 3, Verse 16, and we all know it well, I know, but listen to it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You, you notice there, don't you, that there is no qualification for salvation. There's no exception for salvation. It's simply believe in Christ and have everlasting life. And the whole point of the book, Sinclair Ferguson says, is that if you begin adding exceptions or qualifications to the gospel, you have perverted, you've turned the gospel upside down. It's simply because God so loved the world that He gave us Christ. You know, one of the things that is often, often good to remember is that Jesus did not come to lay down His life with hopes that God would then love you. No, no. God so loved the world, therefore He sent His Son. And so the free offer of the gospel is this, without qualification or exception, that we come to the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a free offer that's made to you even this morning. And it's a promise of salvation and, and an eternal inheritance the, that the Lord would be your portion. That's the offer. Do we have, or can we say with the psalmist David, that the Lord is my portion? You know, I think about the, the covenant language that was used during our baptism, that's used 
throughout the scriptures. This idea that's reemphasized time and time again. I will be your God, thus saith the Lord, and you will be my people. From Genesis 3, with Adam, to Noah, to Abraham, to Moses, to David, in the preachings and teachings of Jesus, in the preaching and teachings of the apostles, the offer of the gospel is, you come to the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in faith and in faith alone. And so it reminds you a little bit of baptism, doesn't you? Doesn't it? It should. Because what we affirm in proclaiming that the Lord is our portion, that the gospel offer is free and full, is that it has everything to do with God and nothing to do with us. What has Eliza done? What has Eliza done to earn her status as a member of this covenant family? Nothing. Nothing. She's a child. She's not able to do anything to earn her salvation, to earn her belonging to the covenant family. What have you done? In and of yourself, you have done nothing to earn your salvation. You have done nothing to deserve to be a part of the covenant family. But the free offer of the gospel is this. You don't have to do anything. God does it all through Christ Jesus as he sends his only begotten son to be a ransom for many. The great Puritan John Bunyan, who wrote that great work, The Pilgrim's Progress, wrote a lesser known work called Come and welcome to Jesus Christ. It's a little bit of a lengthy quote, but it has a, it has a beat to it, so I want to read it all for you. It says, But I am a great sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I am an old sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I am a hard-hearted sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I'm a backsliding sinner, says you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have served Satan all of my days, says you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have sinned against your light, says you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have sinned against mercy, says you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have no good thing to bring with me, says you. And I will no wise cast out, says Christ. You see, the free offer of the gospel, the Lord offers himself to you and he says, I will be your portion as you are my portion. I will be your salvation if you would come to me in Jesus so that we might have communion and harmony and fellowship with one another. And you can list the excuses in which you're not worthy to come. And yet, if you will come in faith, Christ says, I will in no wise cast you out. The offer of the gospel is free. The offer of the gospel is full. And therefore, David says, he is, the Lord is my portion. The greatest gift that the Lord can give to us is himself. And if you'll let that soak in for just a moment, if you think about the the revelation of John as, as the believer enters into heaven, he, he sees the, the golden streets, he sees the river of life, he sees the, the tree, he sees the throne, he sees the, the elders representing the 12 tribes of Judah and the 12 apostles. He sees these living creatures that really nobody knows what they're supposed to represent, but they're really cool looking. He he sees all of these grand things, and he says, but yet my attention always returns to Christ. So much so, the scriptures say that the crown that we receive, the crown of righteousness, will be cast at his feet, and the clothes that we wear will be his clothes. The hymn writer says it best in the hymn, The Sands of Time Are Sinking. It says, the bride eyes not her garment." But her dear bridegroom's face, I will not gaze at glory, but on my King of grace, not at the crown he giveth, 
but on his pierced hands, the lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. And, and that's what, that is the, the reality. That's the reality of this statement, that the Lord is my portion, that we recognize the greatest gift the Lord can give us is himself. But then very quickly, there's a statement of aspiration made here in verse 57 as well. Because you notice as the psalmist David declares that the Lord is my portion, what does he, what does he say immediately after? I promise to keep your word. If we go all the way back to Genesis 3 yet again, we know that there in the first half of that chapter, there is a battle that begins to rage within the life of each and every person. Because Adam is our, our physical head, Romans chapter 6 and 7 says. We are born into sin. We are born into iniquity. And now all of a sudden there's a battle that rages within. Is the Lord my portion or can I find gratification, satisfaction in something else? And so Satan in the form of the serpent holds out this forbidden fruit to Eve and he says to her you will not die but you will be like God and in that moment she thinks I can be satisfied even more if I would listen to this temptation and so she eats and she introduces sin into the world Adam follows and now because of that each and every one of each and every one of us we, we suffer in our sin we, we feel that struggle with our Sin, it plays itself over and over and over again. Can I find a better satisfaction in this world than God? And the psalmist David says that if we proclaim that the Lord is my portion, we are aspiring to say that the Lord is all I want. That the Lord is my treasure. That the Lord is well worth living for. That that holiness, that Christ-likeness, the Lord is who I aspire to live for. Again, you can think about that great hymn, Jesus, Lover of My Soul. I think it's on page 509 in your hymnal. It says in that third stanza, Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in Thee I find. Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in Thee I find. Is the Lord all that you desire in this life? Is His glory all that you live for in this life? You look back at, uh, at verse 72 in, in your Bibles. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. That seems so far-fetched in this world of riches, doesn't it? But is the Lord your portion? Do you desire Him more than anything that this world has to offer? It's the battle that rages within us. And in verses 59 and 60, when I think on your, or when I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. It's as if the psalmist is examining his life his conduct, his way. And he begins to take account of himself and he says, when I look at my behavior, what I should aspire to see is my quick, my quick running to your word to teach me how to live. If you think of it, the prodigal in a far country in Luke chapter 15 runs back to the father. Zacchaeus up in the tree scurries down quickly so that he might feast with Christ in his house. The disciples immediately leave their nets to follow Jesus. The Philippian jailer there in Acts as the earthquake comes and as he hears Paul and Silas singing, he's about to kill himself because he thinks all the prisoners have been released and yet Paul says, no, 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 don't kill yourself. And immediately he asks, how can he know the joy that exists within the heart of Paul. That is, that's how the, the Christian life ought to look. We have to take stock 
in our thoughts, in our life, in our way of our conduct. And we have to think, do I aspire to run to God's word? The unbeliever will say, I can put off God till tomorrow. But what does Hebrews chapter 3 say? Today, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today, don't put God off. Be like the psalmist David here and say, I will hasten and I will not delay to return to your word. That holds out to us Christ who promises that if we'll come in faith, he will be our portion. And in response to him being the greatest gift that we can ever receive, we will aspire to live for his glory. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the opportunity to come to your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that it would convict where it ought to convict, encourage where it ought to encourage. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would be our portion, that we would recognize you as the greatest gift that you have to offer, that we can come freely and fully to God the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that is the greatest thing that we can possess. And so, Father, would we turn our attention to your word that holds out you to us? Would we respond to the gospel quickly? Would we not delay to keep your commandments so that we might live for your glory and your glory alone? Lord, through our proclamation of the gospel, through the way that we live out the gospel, would we be used as as vessels to advance your kingdom. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, it's good for us to sing uh, in response to God's word. And so you see in your hymnal there that our hymn of response is 264. 264, Jesus, keep me near the cross. And let us sing uh, all four verses. Please stand as you're able and let's sing together. Thank you.
it was a privilege to worship with you uh, this morning. We will do it again uh, this evening at 6 p.m. as we continue our journey through the letters to the Thessalonian church. Um, and now let me draw your attention to our bulletin. After the benediction, we'll sing together the Gloria Patri. Now receive the good word of the Lord's blessing. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 